Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. I have another presentation for you guys today. I'm using my old video recording software. Uh, so let me know in the comment section whether you uh, like, seeing, <laughs> like seeing my face in the little window while I'm recording or whether you'd like to get uh, my mug out of the way and continue on just with the, the good stuff being the investment information. If you haven't already liked and subscribed, I greatly appreciate you doing that. I'm a popular investor on eToro, a manager portfolio there, and I'm also an options trader uh, as a private investor. So today we're going to talk about uh, one of my highest conviction plays moving forwards. Uh, it makes me excited slash very nervous <laughs> to uh, to talk about. It's Petrobras, okay? Petróleo Brasileiro. It's the number one energy company in Brazil. It's a huge um conglomerate and every which way that i've sliced it and diced it it just looks so so cheap in terms of valuation perspective so hopefully i don't end up uh, cursing myself with this but there was a comment um on the channel that someone had asked me to review petrobras and transocean today we're going to be looking at uh, the cash flow and company that is petrobras okay so 30 percent dividend yield based on covenant current price uh, as in market cap and dividends stated but obviously the trick with these types of companies is working out how stable that dividend will be so the inform uh, the investment formula i like to use for these sort of longs are uh, we're looking for companies with low debt with a margin of safety that has a sales growth strong margins free cash flow growth and share buybacks and if you look at uh, petrobras over the last five years they've got double digit ebitda growth um, and double digit revenue growth, the EBIT is, is in, uh, depending on which years you look, over about 22% uh, compounded annual growth, which is incredible. And their ability to grow out free cash flows uh, is very, very attractive for those of you who are looking for uh, dividends uh, and income high yielding investments. So here's the price action as of year uh, one year. Uh, and our average entry on eToro is 1396. It's a little bit better in my. Um, Crassus Arb fund because I'm able to use options and so we got better premiums with the entry price but um, 13.96 is not too shabby cursing myself uh, I believe it was around here so towards it was around the nine dollar mark towards the end of last year I looked at it I was still a little bit unsure about the geopolitical risk of investing in Brazil obviously that turned out to be an opportunity cost because uh, we would have done even even better however uh, I think that over the long term based on the dividends alone uh, this investment should turn out to be okay and we're going to look at why Let's start off with those aforementioned uh, risks. I've taken the slide from the previous video that I did last year. So you can go and look at the video I did and see what my thoughts were then and how they may or may not have played out. And so far, basically everything's gone uh, to plan with this particular investment. The risk factors, of course, are Brazil, okay? And corruption taxes, social rents, etc. cetera. And with Bolsonaro in charge, things have been much better, uh, but he, uh, is up for election in uh, the end of this year, I believe, and that could bring some volatility because obviously the uh, the people on the other side of the aisle uh, have said they'll stop at nothing to try and stop him. Um, anyway, we'll we'll see what happens. I think that um, what we'll see moving forward to these. Um, commodity-based companies based in emerging markets will do well. They'll be able to sell, particularly energy companies that sell their top line revenues in US dollars and have a depreciated uh, local currency. We'll see a, a margin expansion between the uh, operating costs and the operating income uh, based on the the differentials in the currencies. The low might be in place for the Heiau. I'm not sure about that. So this is interesting. Currently, this company is absolutely printing cash because they pay the local workers, at least in Heiau. As Petrobras starts to expand offshore, those day rates for offshore rigs, uh, for instance, will be in US dollars. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there in terms of their margins from uh, those revenue segments, uh, which is where I think uh, Transocean might do very well, uh, for instance. Companies such as uh, Stoneco, which we also hold a small position in, they've been smacked down due to the uh, 
the currency depreciation. But they're a type of company that may do well. Uh, when you look at the range bound trading zone between the HAL and the USD, uh, it looks on the lower bounds as opposed to the upper bounds. And it'll be interesting to see how high interest rates in the US can actually go before markets really uh, throw a tantrum. Will they tank the dollar or will they tank the markets and or both? It'll be uh, interesting to see. That's the, the game we're all playing. So here's a, a, a chart mentioning that uh, hey, the US dollar uh, differential. We go all the way back to 2003, I believe there it starts. And so we're at the lowest point in uh, roughly 20 years and moving over to five year charts. And um, you can see that we're at the, the bottom end of that particular range. Okay, so there's nothing to say that can't stay there for long periods of time, in which case it would likely be uh, beneficial for a company like Petrobras. But if we get a mean reversion, um, their margins may suffer a little bit. But I think in order to do that, they uh, you would need to see the price of, of oil start to rise. Uh, and, and I believe it will. So I think that the risks will be offset in terms of margin squeeze. And there is also the option for them to hedge out their currency risks if they believe that to be uh, a prudent action. Looking towards, uh, on a very short term view, projections for most analysts by the end of 2022, I believe they're understated, uh, but they're looking at $3.07 US as a conversion per share, uh, a dividend this quarter was announced at uh, 0.56. So that's why you've seen the stock price drop off recently because it went X dividend. And so if you're looking at that as a percentage, obviously it's a huge percentage of that uh, free cash flow being paid out as a dividend, which means that uh, as I've been saying for a long time now, these companies are not reinvesting in production, which means that that is likely to, to put a, a floor under the oil price. Those people that say, oh, just because oil's gone up, so far, uh, so soon, uh, since 2021, it must mean revert and come back down. But that's ignoring the basic supply and demand. If there is no supply coming online, we're not going to see oil prices start to dip lower until we get to that point where we, people literally cannot afford to buy the oil. And that's more like $180, $185 a barrel. What I've done here is look at the enterprise value. Uh, per share and then come up with an enterprise value yield. And the reason I've done that is that takes into account the debt. So it's all well and good to say it's earning 30% dividend yield, which it is based on uh, market cap currently. However, we need to add into the, the debt and the balance sheet of the company. So if you add in the debt minus the cash, you're getting a 24% yield free cash flow, which is still very, very attractive. And in terms of uh, an EV to an implied yield, if they're able to uh, maintain that quarterly dividend at around that 56 cent mark, then at the current enterprise value, that suggests a, a yield of 17%. Now that is going to become very valuable in my opinion during periods of heightened inflation. People that were calling for inflation to roll over were wrong. We just had that uh, inflation or the CPI number came out uh, over 8% as of yesterday. And so I think that any company that can give you back cash quickly every quarter, uh, such as uh, Petrobras, at a, a rate of 70% per annum, if you minus 8% um, you're looking obviously at somewhere around a 9% real yield. That is very, very valuable in a world where your cash is having its value eroded, its purchasing power eroded at somewhere around 8 to 9% per annum, according to official statistics. So uh, I think that that cannot be overstated in terms of its value moving forwards. Now, uh, as you know, with commodities, I like to build out the matrix because it, because the, the price of which you're selling as a commodity producer is fluctuating. So it's a, it's a three-dimensional uh, chess game moving, uh, moving the goalposts uh, every day of the, the trading week. So these are my assumptions. I can go over this uh, in more detail in another video should people really want to. However, when you look at what analysts have been discounting for this company, they're discounting like less than $50 oil. Um, very, very strange. So what I have done is smooth that out a little bit using the quarterly report of the company and extrapolating that out for the rest of this year. And that is where I'm getting my annualized EBIT numbers. 
Okay. And you can obviously do this. The beauty of having that matrix that I've shown in, I think, Meg Energy's uh, video is that you can put in your own assumptions. And if you want to have uh, a projection for part of the company's production at a hedge, you can look at what the company has done and you can make your own matrix based around that. But anyway, that might be a topic for another day. Today, we're looking at today's price. I am giving this company a an EV to EBITDA multiple of three times, which is ridiculously cheap. And I'm using zero perpetual growth rate. And I'm also using a, a discount rate of 20%. Okay. Meaning that I want these cash flows to give me at least 20% uh, year on year. And based on that, what is the maximum price that I can afford to pay in order to get that return? Now, when you look at that uh, here, we're looking at a, uh, an intrinsic value of close to $18, okay? Here, I'm looking at a dividend payout at about 62%, okay? Just using the, the quarterly report. That may change. I think the company is safe. Uh, it's safe to say that they'll be paying out at least 50% of the surplus free cash flow as dividends, okay? And if that is the case, then you're looking at that sort of implied yield in the, the double digits, okay, which is uh, interesting and a, a very, very good um, projected return. Obviously, that's not set in stone, but if all we can do as investors is model these things out as best we can, take into account the possibilities and the probabilities and, and essentially make our best uh, best bets as of the, the time that we enter uh, or exit positions. So with a, a target price upside, this model suggests a 52%. If you put that into an IRR, you're looking at a 36% IRR, which is obviously very attractive. If we put all that aside for a second and say, okay, what are we really looking for with this type of company? <laughs> The answer for me, generally speaking, is dividends. And I understand people's tax bracket will affect that. I get absolutely smashed for uh, the tax in my individual bracket. So we are looking at taking out some of the risks in all the, of the geopolitical volatility that could be present with this particular company. So we're saying, okay, the company makes a lot of cash. It's the uncertainties around getting that cash back to us as investors that means that this company trades at such a cheap multiple. So let's take the dividend. If we're getting a quarterly dividend and we're seeing that consistently uh, coming into our bank accounts, that gives us a lot more confidence, right? So what would these cash flows be worth alone, just based on the pure dividend? So ignoring potential upside of the share price increasing, let, we're just looking at the amount of cash that is kicked back to us every quarter as investors. So I have used um, this year's projection uh, based off this quarter's dividend, and I've extrapolated that out for the rest of the year to get an annual dividend. And I've said that over the next 10 years, I expect them to be able to grow that at 5% year on year. And then from 10 years onwards, I'm giving them a perpetual growth rate of 3%. So somewhere in line with historical population growth or somewhere in line with historical GDP. Obviously, you are free to change that as you wish. Target rate return for me, again, we're looking for that 20% compounded as a, a minimum return, okay? Here, we're looking at target dividend yield of about 14.8%, okay? So if we were to buy now below that $15 mark, we would safely make our return. So with the, the stock closing at $11.81, that suggests that our dividends alone over the long term, if we sit tight, should be more than enough to, to make us a handsome return on our investment, okay? We can afford to pay up to somewhere around $15 a share. To give you a little uh, visual here, I've put in the chart. I know it makes the slide a bit messy, but I've never been overly concerned with graphic design, as you can tell. Here we've got our estimated dividends in the dark green. So that's the, the top line moving up and to the right. That is in nominal terms, okay? So that's the nominal dollar amount of money that you're getting back over those years. But let's remember that we need to discount that back and say, well, what is that worth in terms of today's money, okay? And so this tracks um, the discounted rate all the way out until such a point where the discounted rate of return equals zero. Okay, and that's out to the, the sort of the 30 year mark. I've only included 10 on the table because you get the point, I'm sure. So there's little lines here that is saying, what is the year nine dividend worth 
in today's money. So it might be worth $3.70-ish, but in today's money, when we apply a discount rate of 20%, it's worth roughly, I don't know, 50 cents, wherever that, that line meets up on the, the y-axis. So I hope you follow me there. If we take the analyst estimate for a dividend, so they're being very conservative of saying $1.71, if I use a 60% payout ratio and I look at a, a base, a bull and a bear case, and the assumptions for uh, each of those you can see here, and I apply a 20% discount rate again, and looking at these terminal multiples, that would suggest the worst case would be a 25% yield. The best case would be a 10% yield. I believe moving forwards, that's not unreasonable, guys. Uh, people are going to be looking for income to offset uh, inflation, and they want it kicked back to them uh, on a regular basis. So if you believe those numbers, or if those numbers are true and correct, you can expect to pay um, $12.12 in order to receive a 20% rate of return, okay? Now, when we look at, when we look at the cash flows in the EBITDA and we value those, so that takes into account, the, the EBITDA takes into account the earnings before interest tax, depreciation, amortization, okay? So it's the revenue minus cost of revenue, basically, uh, and then you add back in all those others that I mentioned. Free cash flow, a little bit different. You've got to subtract your CapEx. So you're saying, how much does this company earn? Then how much does it have to put back into the business to reinvest in order to keep its production? And minus tax as well. So cap, cap, minus CapEx and tax gives you your free cash flow. Part of that can be distributed as dividends or they can buy back stock or they can pay down debt or they can do more or less whatever, but this is the end number at the at the end of the day that goes back to shareholders or in one way or another. So it's available for shareholders. I have kept the assumption that the shares outstanding will remain the same. And these are my numbers of what I would expect this company to do over the next 10 years with the various growth rates, uh, as you can see. Apply different probabilities. I do expect this company to be able to grow its revenue, uh, excuse me, its EBITDA at 10%. Uh, for the next 10 years, given that they've been able to do closer to 20 in terms of its EBIT over the last five years. So I don't think that's a particularly wild assumption. And if you look at the multiples I've given these comp uh, these cases, they're hardly, um, they're hardly ex exuberant. Again, I, I pull it apart because it just, it just looks like things are, uh, are, are perfectly rosy and it's almost like I want to uh, make sure that it's not too good to be true. So if we take it apart and we say today we're paying $11.81 and these are the, the base cases for the cash flows the company's going to receive over the next 10 years. If we discount it at the company's cost of capital, okay, what is that as an IRR? And it's a monster of an IRR, okay? It's trading at a, an incredible free cash flow yield. 42% is very, very good. If we use the same assumption and we do um, an IRR and an MIRR, okay, which takes into account various reinvestment um, functions, you're looking at closer to uh, 22%, which is still very, very good. So as you may have uh, already guessed, my verdict is that I'll be continuing to accumulate. In terms of the Toro portfolio, uh, I'll be building it to over 5% of assets under management. In terms of my own private portfolio, it's I have a sizable position in anyone's uh, language in Petrobras. Part of it's straight equity and part of it's using options. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you haven't already liked and subscribed, I would greatly appreciate you doing so. You can follow me on Twitter at the ROI channel. Uh, you can send me a, a question there or you can leave it in the comment section. And if you're interested in value investing and you don't know where to start, you might consider copying the portfolio or you might just want to put us to a watch list and see uh, what, we're, what we're up to. In which case you can do that on eToro, download the app and the link in the description will allow you to go to the page where you can add us to a watch list and, uh, or copy if you've got funds available that you'd like to mirror the portfolio and have me uh, do the work essentially. And disclaimer, guys, this is my opinion. Now, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't know anything about you uh, or your personal situation. As such, please don't mistake any of this for advice. This is 
what I'm doing, this whole channel is my opinion. It's what I think it may or may not be correct or what might be right for me may not necessarily be right for you. So please understand that your capital is at risk and I want you to really take that seriously. I want you to um, take responsibility for your own decisions and their potential consequences. So once again, none of this is advice. This is what I am doing, what I do with my money. That's all this channel is, is a method of amusing <laughs> amusing myself mainly. But if you've got a question, then obviously I'll give my thoughts on it. Doesn't mean that it's advice. It's just my opinion. Okay. Having said that, I hope that you enjoyed the video. And if you have any questions, as I say, please leave them in the comment section and I'll do my best to get around to them. Thank you.